Thank you so much for having me. And so I have some slides to go through and I would also like this to be somewhat interactive. So feel free to jump in if something brings up a question for you. Um, I will let you know if I'm about to go over that next thing or you know, I can answer questions on the fly. Um, so this is just gonna be informal and we'll finish uh, after the hour. We're gonna keep it firm, okay? Um, so I am a vascular and interventional radiologist, which is shortened to VIR or sometimes even shortened further to IR. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. And um, like, uh, like the host said, I am uh, chief of my section at Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, California. And I'm actually an incoming chairman of uh, the radiology uh, department, which I'm pretty excited about because um, you know, it's a great opportunity for me pretty early in my career. So just, uh, it's never too early to get started in leadership. Um, this, you might be wondering who this crazy guy is at the top of my slide. This is Charles Dodder, and he is the father of interventional radiology. He performed the first angioplasty in the early 1960s. And this woman was, uh, she had a gangrenous foot and uh, was going to get an amputation. And he was able to save the foot with the first angioplasty. So he's got this kind of crazy look in his eye and he has, uh, you know, he had a very innovative spirit and he actually had the nickname Crazy Charlie. So he's kind of like the spirit animal of um, interventional radiology. So we'll be going through a little bit about my field and some of its history, uh, what, who comprises the IR team, some of the tools that we use and some, some of the procedures that we do kind of in broad categories, and then we'll go over some cases. Um, I'll go over some pointers for patient consent and preparation, just so that as you start to approach your shadowing, you'll, you'll know what you're looking for. Um, or as you get onto your rotations, you'll be a great student with those tips in mind. And then we'll wrap up. So this is just a bullet point, uh, history of my field. And you can see from 1964 through, this only goes through 2000, just how many innovations were made in the area of interventional radiology. So it's a pretty new field. Um, angioplasty was performed in 1964. Um, you know, coils that we use to stop bleeding and in the vessels, those were invented in the 70s. Um, Self-expanding stents in 1985, that's like right after I was born. Um, so it's, just, it's pretty young field, pretty amazing, and it's constantly evolving. So that's just the broad point of that slide. Um, then some of you may be familiar with, you know, IR has two major branches. So there's body IR, which is what I do and what I'll be speaking about today. And then there's neuro IR, where they actually, they take out clots when somebody has a stroke or they do aneurysm coiling. And I'm not going to be talking about that today. That's like a whole different branch of interventional radiology. And so the IR I'm talking about is below the neck. So we are generally talking about plumbing. And when I say plumbing, I mean arteries and veins. Um, you know, in the case of a trauma, I work at a trauma center for two, two weeks out of the month. So I'm taking care of people who are actively bleeding, like from a pelvic crush injury or a car accident. Um, I also take care of oncology patients. So cancer patients who need uh, work in the liver, you know, cirrhotic patients or patients who have metastatic implants in the liver. There are localized therapies that we can do for those patients. Um, the field of IR touches men's health and women's health. So some examples of that are varicocele embolization, prostate embolization, and uterine artery embolization. And so these are minimally invasive means to take care of those problems without surgery. And then Kind of the bedrock of IR is venous access. And so we do a lot of, you know, we implant devices for patients who need long-term venous access. And we also maintain access points for those on long-term dialysis. So who makes up the IR team? These are some examples of my IR team. So you've got the interventional radiologist, that's me and my colleagues. Uh, IR technologists. So these three on uh, your right hand side are technologists and they act as like the surgical first assist in a case. So they set up the room and they hand me the wires and they know what all the equipment is so that they can be like my extra set of hands. And then we have two nurses in each, in each case and some of our patients are quite sick. So these are like ICU level nurses 
um, they typically come either from the ER or the ICU. And so these, uh, these three people here on the left are there, a few of my nurses that I've worked with. So it really, Sorry. it really is a team sport. In the chat, before we continue asking, um, if it's true that IR will be becoming a completely separate domain from diagnostic radiology? Yes, in 2017, we became our own uh, specialty certified by the, um, uh, you know, we became a primary specialty along medicine, surgery, and all the others. So yes, there's a separate match now, and um, it's its own specialty. But as far as um, in the practice setting, that's more of an evolution in progress. And so most interventional radiologists still work in concert. We work together with diagnostic radiologists. And in my community, for example, like I work at a bigger hospital where I do my trauma work, and then I work at a smaller hospital one, one week out of the month. And there I'm doing most, mostly diagnostic work. So, you know, reading the ER belly scans and the x-rays and the MRIs. So in a lot of practices, those two disciplines still go hand in hand. Great, thank so there's you. Not a really, there's not a really clear cut answer for that right now. It's, it's kind of an evolution in progress. Um, you know, over time it may become like radiation oncology where it completely splits off. You know, that used to be part of radiology. So over time, definitely, that's a good question. Okay. So these are some of the tools just to give you a really high level view of what we use in the minimally invasive toolbox. So we're doing procedures without having to cut the patient open surgically. And so the way that we do this is we use ultrasound. This is an example of visualizing the jugular vein. Here's a carotid artery. So this is what we would use to get access for either a dialysis catheter placement or potentially like a TIPS, placing a shunt through the liver. So we use this uh, handy vessel here for both of those things. Down here you have, uh, this is just one example of a wire, but we have lots of different wires with different properties that we use for different purposes. Um, these blue and gray things are catheters. So diagnostic catheters are little plastic tubes and they go over the wires and they allow us to navigate through the body under X-ray guidance. And you can see they have these different shapes to help us do that. We talked about angioplasty. Daughter did the first uh, angioplasty by daughtering a lesion, which is he just dilated it with a, like a sequentially graded uh, instrument. But later on, these were invented. This is a balloon catheter where you could put this over a wire and if in a stenotic vessel, you could prop it open with the balloon. So a pretty awesome tool that we have that we still use today. Again, there are balloons with different properties and you know we use them for different reasons in different places, different sizes and all of that. And here at the bottom, these are microspheres. And so we use that for embolization or blocking off small vessels. So these are just a few examples of some of the tools we use to accomplish our work without cutting the patient. Uh, we talked about venous access. So this is an example of a temporary dialysis catheter that goes right into the jugular vein or sometimes the femoral vein. Um, this is an example of a tunneled catheter. So you can see that this lady has uh, under the skin, the catheter runs there and that helps to prevent infection. So the catheter can stay in longer. And then some of you may have seen this before. This is a chest x-ray with a, a right chest port, and it's got a little catheter that you can probably hardly see, but it's going down toward the, the junction with the right heart. So these are some of the simpler, like more straightforward cases that we do as interventional radiologists. And this video, I'll let me know if you can hear the explanation or not. No, we cannot hear that. Okay. So similar to what I just showed you, so this is a port I had just placed and you can see this is the port, uh, which is like a less than one inch diameter piece that's surgically implanted under the skin. And so that's the one case where I act almost like a surgeon. I actually make an incision and uh, then tunnel this catheter, this plastic tube under the skin and have access here in the jugular vein right over the collarbone. And then that port has access to the central veins. So the patient can get strong chemotherapy without it burning the peripheral veins. 
And also they can get frequent blood draws without having to get their arms poked all the time. So this is just one example of an implantable device. And um, just in a broader view, it's kind of, it's very cost effective and it's great to be able to do this in interventional radiology because we can do it with moderate sedation. We don't require an anesthesiologist and we can just do it, you know, the patient feels the local anesthetic and then, you know, a, a bit of pushing and then 30 minutes or less and they're done. So patients tolerate that really well under moderate sedation and it's very cost effective. So it's really good for the health system to do it this way. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, I have an example for you, which is a little more interactive. So say somebody calls you um, as a consultant about a GI bleed. So I, I get a call that somebody has a GI bleed, which is a gastrointestinal hemorrhage. So what are some things that I would like to know about the patient's history? Feel free to chime in. So if you were evaluating this GI bleed, what would you want to know? So Alexandra said uh, if they're anticoagulated, there's um, past medical history, history of ulcers, what medications they're on, um, Perfect. their diets, allergies. Someone else said anticoagulant as well. Perfect. Yeah. Um, do they have they had any surgery? Uh, do they have a history of diverticulosis? That's like a common cause of GI bleeding. Um, so yeah, you touched on a lot of great things. Are they pertinence in the patient's history, which you mentioned were, would be things like cancer, um, you know, NSAID use, those can cause ulcers. Um, so you're, you're definitely on the right track with all those questions you asked. So this happened, this case I'll show you, it's a 56 year old patient with pancreatic cancer and they had, uh, cancer was actually compressing the bile system. So they had a palliative common bile duct stent placed um, and they had a three week history of melana. Does anybody know what melana is? Someone in the, there's multiple chats saying dark tarry stool, black stool or bloody stool. Yeah, awesome. So I didn't know it at the pre-med level. I don't think I knew that, so <laughs> that's great. Um, so patient, what that means is basically that the blood has a chance to make it through the bowel and gets partially digested and it results in this black tarry substance. Um, and so we like to classify GI bleeds as proximal and uh, distal, so proximal to the ligament of trites is usually would be an upper upper GI bleed and then lower would be distal to the ligament of trites, which would be jejunum ileum colon. So that helps to localize a little bit. So just, just hearing the history that they've had a three week history of melana, it gives you some idea that this is probably an upper GI bleed that we're dealing with. And also knowing that pancreatic cancer can be locally invasive. So that was the case here. Um, and then some of the other parameters that I like to know if I'm going to be asked to intervene on somebody like this, they are hemodynamically stable. So what are their vital signs? You know, are they crashing uh, with a blood pressure of, you know, 75 over 30, or are they just, you know, totally um, just sinus rhythm with, uh, you know, 120 over 80? It makes a big difference for how, how quickly you act and what kind of workup you can do um, before you get started treating. So the INR is a measure of the coagulation factors made by the liver. So this patient's a little bit coagulopathic with an INR of 1.3, where a normal would be one. And platelets are 152, so low normal. Hemoglobin 7.1, that's low. And then I have a video here. So I guess I can just... So first I'll go over the CT findings. And so this gentleman had a CT with IV contrast. You can see that the this is the aorta and this is the heart. So they're lighting up with contrast as compared to these other tissues. Um, so this is with IV contrast. And so as we come down in a cancer patient, this is a common incidental finding. There's actually a filling defect in this pulmonary artery. So they have a pulmonary embolism on top of what they're dealing with. So just kind of a common 
quagmire with cancer patients. Okay, so here, I, so we're slicing the patient this way. It's called transaxial image. Uh, this is a CT scan, and you can see this is an atrophic pancreas. So this has, you know, most of the parenchymal tissue, this lighter tissue is atrophic. And this darker thing in the middle is the pancreatic duct. And so that's dilated. Anything over three millimeters is dilated. And that is common to see in the setting of a pancreatic head malignancy. So as we come this is coming down here into the pancreatic head area. You've got this ill-defined mass. Here's the biliary stent. And in here we can start to see, you can see there's this vessel up here which is contacting the mass. So this actually ends up being the problematic vessel, which we'll see in a minute. But this is abnormal. We've just got this big mass here, whereas normally the pancreatic head would just be more demarcated here. Would you have so if that's a little question? hard to see, don't worry. This is a four-year residency just to read these images. Is there a question? Yeah, so um, a lot of people are wondering the difference between contrast and no contrast CT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, contrast is something that we put into the vein which allows us to uh, get better tissue contrast between different, uh, different tissues in the body. And so we can use it in the different phases. So say as an interventional radiologist, I often, I, I like to see an arterial phase if I'm evaluating something that has to do with the arteries like an aneurysm or some bleeding. So that would be called a CT angiogram. And then we can do multi-phase studies. So depending on the timing of between the injection and then when you actually image the patient, that'll be the phase of contrast enhancement. And you can use this in different ways to visualize different parts of the body better. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so everybody was listening about the melena. Good job. Okay. So now I'm moving over to the angiogram and um, let me just get a better image for you. So this is under live x-ray guidance. It's also known as fluoroscopy or fluoro for short. And the way that I use that is, so in this patient I accessed in the right common femoral artery. So just like you would do a coronary cath, if anybody has a family member who's had that before, you know, they, we go into the thigh crease um, right in the groin and under ultrasound, I access the common femoral artery. And then it, from there, I can get to most anywhere in the body. Um, you know, they'll even access in the groin to go up and get a stroke, uh, do a stroke thrombectomy. So it's a very nice vessel for access because it's a, you know, big enough for us to put our devices in and it's, you know, able to be accessed pretty safely. Um, so from there, Oh, I'm just gonna minimize this poll. So from there, this image is showing that I have a catheter here in, this is the, the patient's upper abdomen. And this little ghost is a catheter that I've put up under x-ray guidance. And I'm going to engage the arteries that are uh, supplying the area of interest. Okay, so here's a better image for you. And as you start to study your anatomy, you'll learn these blood vessels and now maybe you'll have something to anchor it to. Like, why do I care about this blood vessel? Okay, so the aorta comes down from the heart on the left side of the body, usually in a paraspinal region, unless it gets really tortuous. Um, <clears throat> so this catheter is in the aorta. I've just come from the groin, like I mentioned. And then this is the celiac axis. So this is a large blood vessel that supplies much of the upper abdomen. And so you can see this is the patient's right side and this is the patient's left because that's the way x-rays work. It's like the patient's looking at you. Um, so this really torturous, this squiggly vessel is the splenic artery. So in most people, it's very squiggly. And then here you have the common hepatic artery 
and then the gastroduodenal artery. This is our uh, artery that we're gonna target for intervention. And then after the takeoff of the gastroduodenal artery, then this is the proper hepatic artery. So this is the, these are the blood vessels of the liver here. And you can see that biliary stent in place. So here you can see my, uh, this is a catheter that's positioned in the common hepatic artery. And then through that, I placed a smaller micro catheter, which is kind of like a little piece of linguine that I can guide over a micro wire into the gastroduodenal artery. So you can see it's right alongside this biliary stent. This is the blood vessel that's supplying. Um, this is where the tumor has basically eroded into the duodenum. And so to treat this, I'm able to sacrifice the vessel. And the way I do that is with this little microcatheter, I bring it across the area of injury, which is here, and I can coil back and the patient stops bleeding. So these are micro coils here. So does that make sense? Any questions about that? So these, the blood will clot around these coils so that that artery becomes shut down. And after that, the patient got better. So we use a, you know, the same vessel to treat duodenal bulb ulcers. Um, sometimes the gastroenterologist might even see a visible vessel there. Um, and the there, is, there was just a question about the cath lab in general. Mm -hmm. And kind of, um, you know, what would be, why would a patient need to go to the cath lab um, rather or just doing a procedure in their room? Oh, sure. Um, so cath lab is usually used for cardiology. We, they call it cardiac cath. Um, but sometimes people use it interchangeably to mean an IR suite as well. Or sometimes they're shared among different specialties. Um, but why, why can't we do this in the patient's room? Because we need the specialized fluoroscopy equipment, which is basically a specialized bed that the patient lays on. So you can image them with live x-ray as you're working. Great. And then there was a couple of people wondering from that picture you have on the screen, they asked if there would be a buildup once the artery is cut off. Yeah, so now the blood flow, it can still continue going to the liver because we haven't placed any coils in the liver artery. And this vessel, the vessel that was affected by the tumor is now permanently blocked off. Um, the, you may be wondering how will the duodenum get its blood supply? Then will the duodenum have a problem called ischemia, not enough blood flow? The reason we can sacrifice a vessel is because this part of the gut is very well collateralized. That means there are lots of different vessel territories that work together to supply the blood supply. So the tumor was directly eroding into this vessel and it, it needed to be taken out. Um, but there's another branch I can show you. So the next vessel down in the aorta is the superior mesenteric artery, which you'll learn about in anatomy. <clears throat> And this is an angiogram of that. So I've just taken my catheter out. It was right up here before in the celiac axis. And then usually right below that, right around the L1 vertebral body level, there's this vessel, which is the superior mesenteric artery. And you can see it's got these little branches coming over to the duodenum as well. And then it comes over here to supply like the cecum, the small bowel. So all of these branches are important um, in collateral flow. So does that answer that? Yes, I think that answered it. And then on a follow-up to that, someone asked if the number of coils affects patients in any ways, any negative ways. Yeah, so we um, know more coils, it won't harm the patient. Uh, the more coils you put in, the more artifact there could be on subsequent CT scans. Um, because there's metallic artifact, the x-ray behaves a certain way with that. So it might obscure something that's very close by. Um, but it's not going to affect the, they're, you know, they're, uh, not going to move during an MRI. Um, they're not ferromagnetic, which is, you know, they're not going to be pulled by the magnet. Um, and 
they're non-allergenic, they're completely inert. So these are quails usually like in, uh, made with platinum. So they're non-allergenic. Great, thank you so much for that explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are all the different properties you get to learn about if you wanna work with these tools. It's really, it's amazing what, it's basically like biomedical engineering, you know? Um, so people with that background do really well. <laughs> Not that I did. I was just a I was just a bio major. And you can do fine with with any major you want. So um, here are some of my pearls for G, uh, so gastrointestinal bleeds. Uh, most cases of lower GI bleeding cease on their own. So if you have you know small bowel tumors are rare. So causes of small bowel bleeding are are less common. And then um, a lot of lower GI bleeding is caused by diverticulosis, which is like very widespread in the population. And those tend to just stop on their own. So you're not always going to be treating those angiographically, like I just showed you with this case. Um, and, you know, when you're at the point where you're evaluating these patients, like, you know, you're consulting interventional radiologist, or if it's, if it's you learning to fill this role, you know, you'll want to know, has gastroenterology seen the patient? Have you localized the site of bleeding? In this case, we knew the patient was a cancer patient. We were pretty suspicious where the site of bleeding was localized. Um, but if you're not sure and the patient just has bright red blood per rectum and you don't know if it's upper, brisk upper GI bleeding or could be lower GI bleeding, you can do a CTA of the abdomen like we touched on briefly, which is looking at the arterial phase and then delayed phases to see if you can see like a structural problem, like a tumor, diverticulosis, and then whether you can actually see the contrast spilling out into the lumen of the bowel. So it's really helpful to localize that bleeding. And then you know which vessel you're gonna go target with your angio first, especially if the patient's unstable and you need to act quickly, this is really helpful. So here's another case, um, this is just it's an example of something that they might ask me to evaluate if a patient comes into the ER with a cold leg. So uh, these images are digital subtraction angiogram images, which means that with live x-ray, the machine takes an x-ray of the leg and then uh, another image with the contrast going through the arteries and subtracts the original x-ray so you can just, the arteries stand out. So can anybody tell me what they, is there a problem here? What's, what's going on? We're waiting for some responses to trickle in. Um, someone asked if it could be obstructed blood flow. Mm -hmm. Someone yeah. said one of the vessels looks blocked, um, lack of blood flow. Mm -hmm. It looks like the artery just stops, occlusion, restriction. I like that description. Yeah, it's like an abrupt cutoff, which is one of the descriptors that we might use when we're dictating this. So perfect. And just so you have some more context, this is below the knee. You can see there's like no arterial flow. So this is kind of like before and this is after, after our intervention that we did. Um, so this is what it should look like where you have some blood flow through, this is the superficial femoral artery in the thigh. This is the popliteal artery, which has some areas of narrowing, which we call stenosis. And these are the vessels below the knees. So you have the anterior tibial artery, the posterior tibial artery, and the perineal artery. So these are all the important things when you're working in the lower extremity arterial system. And there's a clue here, there's absolutely no filling below the knee. I mean, there's just a streak of flow. So that tells me the blood vessels haven't had time to collateralize if this had been going on for a while usually the body will find some bypass and they'll use some geniculate arteries like arteries around the knee to actually bypass uh, to the vessels below the knee, but that hasn't happened. So this is an acute problem. This just happened. So I'm going to guess that this patient has had symptoms for like probably less than 24 hours, just looking at these images. Okay. So uh, let's see, I wanna leave some time at the end. So I'll just breeze through this a little bit quickly. So this is a 69 year old female with atrial fibrillation. So does anybody know what the implication of that is? So what test do you wanna perform next? 
Um, someone said blood clots, and there's several people saying clots, and then um, there's two considerations. Someone said ab ablation or an angio, possibly, an EKG. Yeah. A stress test. Mm -hmm. you're, all, you're very close to what I'm thinking, but maybe this is like a guess what I'm thinking question. So you're right, in the setting of atrial fibrillation, clots can form in the heart. And so uh, a treatment for atrial fibrillation, a potential treatment is to do a cardiac ablation, which I won't speak to because it's not my area. Um, but the test that I think you should perform next would be an echocardiogram. And that's an ultrasound of the heart to see if there are actually any clots in the heart. And so of course this is really concerning because the patient not only could get what's akin to a stroke in the leg, which we're seeing here, but they also could get this in the brain. So if they have clot in the heart, one of those clots could potentially shoot up to the brain. So really a very important condition to work up if we see this. Okay, so you might be familiar with this lady and she is uh, well known to have, you know, an, an inter interventional radiology procedure and I think for privacy reasons, you know, it never really came out exactly what she had. But at Walter Reed, this is a renal angiogram. So this is a picture of the kidney art blood vessels. And so it was speculated that she had what's called an angiomyolipoma because in the news, they just said she had a benign condition that was treated. Um, so this is a, uh, this is an axial CT image showing, you can see this is the liver. This is some fat around the kidney. This is some fat under the skin. And so this is a fatty lesion in the kidney. This is an angiomyolipoma. So this is probably what Melania had treated. This is a case where the person has tuberous sclerosis. They, are, they can form multiple AMLs or angiomyolipomas. So not all AMLs, if they're small, they don't all need to be treated. But when they reach a certain size, they, they can bleed. And so here's an example of sort of a larger one. This is a coronal image where we're slicing the patient this way this time. Like you're kind of looking into them, into their belly with x-ray vision. And so here you see again that fat density within the lesion, typical of an AML. And I found this really nice case where somebody shared an angiogram. So this, you can see the tumor vascularity out here beyond the confines of the kidney because that's where the tumor is. And they went on. So this is the arterial phase of the angiogram where you see the arteries and this is the parenchymal phase. So you just wait and you can see this tumor stain develop. And here they put multiple microcoils to embolize that lesion. So they, they found these little feeding vessels to the tumor and you know they probably blocked some of the renal parenchyma as well. They probably cut off blood supply to some of the kidney as well. But the benefit is now the patient doesn't have to get a nephrectomy for this lesion that's right in the middle, hanging off the middle of the kidney. So it'd be really hard to do a partial nephrectomy here. I don't even know if that's possible. Um, but instead, you could do this minimally invasive procedure to block off flow so that this person's not at risk of basically having a life-threatening bleeding episode. So pretty awesome. So that's what our first, our, well, I guess she's still our first lady. That's what, that's what people speculate that she had done. Any questions about that? Um, there's a question from one of the images and they're asking if that's metastasis that was seen. In the kidney? Yes, I believe so. So an angiomyolipoma is a benign mass. And so, you know, I've seen, they, they can be seen in young people who have no, they're just a benign mass and to be honest, I'm not sure, aside from association with things like tuberous sclerosis, where you have these multiple lesions that I showed you. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, they're benign. And then someone else asked if a polycystic kidney will show up like that on a CT scan. So polycystic uh, kidney disease is different, and that has a variable pattern of bilateral renal cysts. So this is not a cyst, this is a fat containing solid mass. And yeah, so with practice looking, practice looking at images, you learn to differentiate a cyst from a mass. Of course, there are cystic masses too. 
So cysts that may have solid components or septations. Um, so all of these things are things that are important as you walk through medicine, you'll learn all the different, um, like through pathophysiology, you'll learn a lot of that. Um, but this is, yeah, totally different process from polycystic kidney disease, which uh, results in just innumerable cysts throughout both kidneys. So you're not going to see polycystic kidney disease just in one kidney and then a normal kidney. When you see polycystic kidney, it's going to affect both kidneys. Um, the degree of, you know, cysts formation can be so large that the kidney can become really large. Like a normal kidney is like nine to 13 centimeters. These kidneys can be like 15, 20 centimeters. Um, so polycystic kidney can enlarge the kidney quite a bit. Um, and then they have problems with renal function. So the renal function can go down and they're also associated with liver cysts. So that's kind of like an imaging pattern that if you do, if you take care of those patients or if you go into imaging like I have, then you, you'll start to see those patterns. Um, there was a couple of questions just about benign masses. Um, and I guess that depends on, it's a case to case basis, but could a benign mass have any adverse effects on like any arteries or any of the other anatomy if not removed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like this is a great example of something that's benign. It's not going to metastasize anywhere. It's not going to kill the patient unless it bleeds. And so that's why it's great. Sometimes we just find these incidentally. People are just walking around with these and they don't even know. Um, if they're less than a centimeter, then we just mention them and move on. But once they get to be two, three centimeters, you know, once they grow and they have an increasing potential to bleed. So it's a great example of something that's benign that may not act benign, it may actually hurt you. Um, another example in the liver would be like an adenoma. So if adenomas in the liver grow, you know, that's, those actually have malignant potential. Um, so a little bit different, but the, the major worry is that they can actually bleed if they grow. Great, thank you for those clarifications. So you're, I love the hunger for knowledge and you're gonna be really fascinated when you go through pathophysiology because there's all this stuff to learn about. Um, so this is just, um, you know, when you are working with an IR or if you're, you know, shadowing a surgeon and you need to consult your IR, these are some of the things that you're going to keep in mind. So, you know, it's like a consultative service. So we need to know everything about your patient. We need to be able to contact you once we've formulated our opinion. Um, we need to know if the patient can give consent for a procedure. If not, who's giving consent? That's a really big deal in medicine. Um, you know, sometimes if I have a trauma come in, they can't give their consent and we waive consent for you know, just to act in the, in the setting of an emergency. Um, does the patient speak English? So I, I took classes in medical Spanish. I highly recommend that if you have the opportunity during medical school or even before or after. And Google Translate is also very helpful to fill in the gaps. So if you have budding language skills and you just, you know, you need a few keywords, that's really helped. Um, so anticoagulants, is the patient on any blood thinners? When was their last dose? Like all of these things are really important when you're gonna puncture the blood vessels or a solid organ. Um, what's the patient's coagulation profile? So these helps to shape you know, the consent process and tell us how safe a certain procedure will be versus how much risk the patient will take on to do the procedure. And then somebody mentioned earlier allergies. So specifically when we're working with iodinated contrast, which is a uh, contrast contains, that contains iodine. And that's, you saw that on the CAT scan and you also saw that on the angiogram. And so some patients actually have anaphylactic reactions to this contrast. So that's really important to know so that we don't give them contrast if they have an allergy. And most procedures in IR are done with moderate sedation. So this means the patient's awake and breathing on their own. And that's why we have dedicated nurses taking care of them, watching their vital signs and giving small doses of potent medications. And that keeps the patient a bit more comfortable and uh, relaxed during the procedure. So we give anxiolytics, usually Versed, um, which is a benzodiazepine. And then we give small doses of fentanyl, which is an opioid. Um, and that just helps to keep the patient kind of relaxed uh, while we're working. And to do moderate sedation, the patient has to have nothing in their stomach for six hours. 
this is just a cartoon because the gastroenterologist, this is a cartoon of a guy doing an upper endoscopy. So they, they also use similar medications and uh, Versed can actually uh, cause amnesia. Uh, it can have amnestic effects. And so sometimes you might wanna warn the patient about that. It's temporary, of course. And informed consent is really imp important. So these are some of the things that we discuss before we embark on a procedure with a patient. You know, these are some of the risks. And, and of course we discuss the benefits of the procedure as well but not every minimally invasive procedure will be successful. Um, so we talk about procedure failure or the need for an additional procedure. And then some uh, procedure risks are very procedure specific, like in the case of lung biopsy or angiography. So um, my field is very male dominated. And if you Google interventional radiology, you might come up with a picture like this where you see a couple of men working, but I hope over time we'll have more women enter the field and that's, you know, this is a picture of me in my environment. I'm working here in my IR suite. And I think I had a, a male first assist. And, uh, but we do exist. So even though my field is just 8% or 9% women, depending on the region, we are spread across the country. And here are some examples. So this is at a national meeting. And this is part of the reason I started my blog two years ago is to showcase what a great career you can have in some of these male dominated fields that otherwise women might be kind of put off that, well, where are all the women, um, you know, or they might be discouraged not seeing a um, female kind of mentor to look up to. So that's why I started my platform. It's called tiredsuperheroine.com. And I talk a lot about my journey and out of that came this book. So it's called Save Lives, Enjoy Your Own, Finding Your Place in Medicine. And the reason I wrote this book is when I was going through training, I just, I knew that what I wanted to do was super interesting, but I didn't know if I'd have to sacrifice my whole life to go into it. And um, being on the other side now, I'm six and a half years out into practice. I just want to share with other people that, you know, you don't have to sacrifice enjoyment of your life. You can actually save lives and still enjoy your own. Um, this is like what the contents look like. So finding your place in medicine. I talk a lot about the things that we have in common with other procedural specialties. You know, people will, you need to figure out if you want to work with your hands, if you're ready to, you know, if you're interested in attending to emergencies. Um, it's not for everybody, but it's definitely exhilarating when you can save a life or save limbs. Um, Yeah, perfect. We have a ton of people in the chat just saying how awesome that is that you've talked about that and many people have read your book or it's on their list. So awesome. That's awesome. Good. I'm so glad because I I feel like there is a gap. And if you go to Amazon, you're not going to find like a lot of women in medicine books. And I also, you know, I want to encourage the guys to pick it up too, because um, not only is it helpful to see like just to open your eyes to what your female colleagues, some of the challenges that they might face in addition to all the challenges of medicine. But also, I mean, it's like a user's guide to this decision. It's, uh, it's a really big decision, what you're going to do with your life. And you're doing it under a lot of stress when you're trying to learn everything under the sun. So I thought this would, you know, it's, it's a nice, uh, here, I have a copy here. <clears throat> you know, it's not encyclopedic or anything. It's a nice quick read, but I think it's really helpful if you're approaching that decision. Yeah, so it looks like everybody got this right. And definitely not what insurance do they have. I take care of everybody, regardless of whether they pay or not. <laughs> now, if you're on the outpatient side, that can be a little bit different. It's a very interesting, interesting answer. Okay, should I end the poll? Is that okay? You can just X out at the top and then we'll end it in a couple seconds. Okay. Um, and so in addition to the deciding what you wanna do with your life, I talk about troubleshooting some of the difficulties that you might encounter. Like, um, you know, even the guys may encounter something like this uh, where people will say, oh, do you wanna do something easier? That's too demanding. Um, like for example, I, you know, at two in the morning, you might find me running to the hospital, like to 
embolize a blood vessel because somebody was in a car crash. And to me, that's really exhilarating. And it's kind of uh, it's part of what I live for. And um, it's one of the most gratifying things I can do is to do some of these procedures for people who really need them. But um, you might just run into people who think, well, you know, there are other easier things to do. So um, how to, I talk about some ways to tease that out and figure out like what's right for you. So yeah, with that, I'll just open it up. We have some time for questions and just an open forum. And Thank you so much. Can, yeah, this was a super helpful with presentation. There was many people who learned a lot. Um, and I think there were several comments saying that they're ordering your book as we speak right now. If you want a signed one, then go to my website. If you don't care about having it signed, you can get it on Amazon. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, I think there is an, a question at the beginning when you were talking about the tools that you use. And yeah. someone asked about how the emergence of AI, how will it affect how you do procedures, if at all, and what direction you see that going in? Yeah, so AI is, it's going to be really interesting to see where we go in the future. And right now it's being applied to diagnostic radiology more because, you know, artificial intelligence, it can, in my view, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I think it's going to help us to be more um, efficient in our work and it's going to help us to do our work better as humans. I do not see any way that interventional radiologists are going to be replaced anytime soon. And even, you know, on the diagnostic side, when I was doing like breast imaging and training, we would have what was called computer-aided detection. And it was pretty rudimentary. It would put little triangles and circles on what the computer picked out in the breast was like worrisome. And 90% of the time it was just like, you would blow those things off. So it didn't seem super sophisticated, but that said, you know, technology advances really quickly. There's some, um, you know, on the diagnostic radiology side, I hope that it will streamline our processes and allow us you know, prevent us from missing things. I think you could improve patient care, but it's, um, and on the IR side, I think it's, it's not really tapped yet. Like people, we haven't seen a lot of AI application. We're just at the very, very tip of that process. Absolutely. Um, there's a bunch of questions asking about why do you believe that um, IR is dominated or is more male dominated traditionally and how it's changing? I think because it's a surgically oriented field and for many years surgery was like completely male dominated and because of some actions by the surgeons and specifically like some pioneers who put together the Association of Women Surgeons and they put together this amazing support network I think that's why they have made such inroads in helping women and supporting them and making them feel like they belong. And, you know, so I think we need to, we can reduplicate that in other fields because I feel like I have such a great career. I'm sure, you know, there are lots of other great careers, but to me, the demographics are so skewed. And so I think we need to look at that because, you know, if we have women, you know, say fibroid embolization, women often prefer to see a female provider for that if they can, because I've had cramping pain from periods. I like, I know what to ask. I, of course, a man could learn what to ask as well. And, you know, there are lots of guys doing that work very well. Um, but we need a diverse workforce because we have a diverse population and studies show that patient care is just better that way. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's also a lot of questions about um, work-life balance because, I mean, that's something that you talk about a lot. Um, and just does your specialty make it a little bit easier or is that something that you kept in consideration? Yeah. Uh, so when I was choosing my specialty, I didn't have a family yet and I didn't know if that would happen for me. Um, so I wanted to choose my specialty based on what was most what was pulling me, kind of like what my inner drive was telling me to do and where I felt my talents lied and, and that kind of thing. And I think, I think you can make anything work. And then, oh yes, I can definitely sign a book and send it to Canada. Um, so just, I'll make a note, I need to add shipping regions. So just 
make a note there if you want me to send a signed book to you and I'll add the shipping region and then you can go, then you can buy one. Yeah, thank you for telling me. So I'll add Canada. I have random, <laughs> you have to add them one by one. So I have like Saudi Arabia is set up, Kenya is set up and the US and I just need to add Canada. Um, yeah, so work-life balance, I talk a lot about that on my blog, about what that has actually looked for, like for me as a mother. I think it's, uh, you know, to me, it kind of gave me a chuckle because people would say, well, women shouldn't wake up in the middle of the night for emergencies. Like, I guess your family needs you. But, you know, one, one night I'd wake up for my baby crying and the next night I'd wake up for a trauma. And that's why I named my blog Tired Superheroine because both things are really gratifying, but, and they both make life like worth it. <laughs> um, but there's time to recover, there's time to rest. So I, I, I'm not a martyr in my tiredness. I think there's a good, there's such thing as a good tired. And so that's what I aim to convey. Great, thank you for that insight. I think that's um, really important to hear. <laughs> um, there was a couple of questions about just how you chose to go into IR. So in medical school, was your ro rotation in just radiology and then you decided to specialize in IR later on or how did that work for you? Yeah, at my medical school, the, you, you did not have a built-in radiology rotation, which a lot of people think everyone should go through radiology because it's important. Um, so, and then when you took a radiology elective, you would cycle through every area of radiology. So you'd go from body to neuro to nuclear medicine, to IR, to chest, you know, there are all these different areas. And um, yeah, so the second I saw my first interventional procedure, I saw a guy, he was literally cursing his way through a fistulogram, which if anybody knows, it's like the most, like people get really bored of them because you can, you can do a lot of them in a career. And <laughs> so, so this guy was like cursing his way through this case that, you know, people don't love fistulograms sometimes. And I thought he was a wizard. I just thought, this is amazing. He's doing this work to reopen the blood vessels through this little pinhole access. I thought, I thought he was a wizard. And I just, I think I knew right away that that's what I wanted to do. So, um, and yeah, so there are a few different pathways specifically into IR at this point. You can definitely find, so on my website, I have some links to the Society of Interventional Radiology, like some important pages that you might look at. Of course, my site is for people who are not interested in IR as well. I just talk about IR because it's what I know. Um, but yeah, they have uh, information about the different pathways. So the, like, because I'm, I'm going to joke, I'm becoming a dinosaur. But, you know, in my day, we, um, you had to go through an, so an intern year, you did four years of radiology residency, which the imaging part, you need to be really strong. So it's no time wasted. Um, and then I did a one-year fellowship in IR, so one intense IR year. And now there are two other approaches. One is called early specialization in IR, where you can, uh, midway through your residency, you can like veer off toward IR so you can get more ICU experience. You can get more IR rotations than you otherwise would. Um, so that's called ESIR, early specialization. And then uh, there's the IRDR residency. So now we have our own residency, which is, really competitive, um, but I think it's always been pretty competitive. So I bet the most important thing is that if you're interested in something like this or a similar competitive field, you know, I was no research genius and um, just showing up and, you know, making connections with people and getting involved like in educational projects. If you're not a research genius, um, then, you know, those are all good things. And somehow I was able to get, you know, all the way up into leadership now so if I can do it, you can do it. Great, thank you. And I guess now we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. So our final question for you is, what advice would you leave us uh, college, post-bac, pre-medical students, especially now with COVID going on? My advice is to, uh, in general, is to not, uh, not settle on your career based on other people's expectations. Um, but at your stage, I guess I should have some better advice for your stage. So, um, you know, you're going to be telling your grandkids about this experience. You're going through a worldwide pandemic. So as hard as it is, you know, you're not going to be able to go, you're not going to be able to interview the same way or like shadow people. 
but you do have these things that didn't used to exist. So it's pretty cool. Like we can do this virtually. Um, and I, I feel like I've made real connections with people online. Like when I was growing up and AOL was just starting, I mean, it was like, you know, it wasn't really seen as a real connection, but this is like how we, this is part of our world now. So I would really, um, you're all taking advantage of it, obviously, but don't feel like you're at some disadvantage and it's such a competitive world. So, I mean, everybody's going through the same thing. Like if you can't go do a shadowing experience, somebody else can't go do. So, you know, this, there's a little bit of a rat race element, but just like try to keep calm about it. And, you know, um, because everybody's going through this, this crazy pandemic together. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. And everything you said was so true. So thank you for that inspiration. <laughs> keep going. Awesome. So